Hello, welcome to our show. Uh, we are thrilled to have a very special guest on today, uh, pastel artist Denise Larue Malky. Now, as we heard from Joe Bowler, a good painting is a good painting. So it really doesn't matter if it's watercolor, pastel, oil, or whatever the case may be. Uh, so Denise is done a very, very good job uh, in pastel over the years and has gone all over the United States, painting in plain air, being in shows. And uh, we're really excited to get her perspective on her work today and talk about her favorite medium of pastel. So without further ado, Denise, thank you for being on with us today. Thanks, Clay. I'm excited to be here. I really appreciate it. Well, the studio looks fantastic and a uh, little bit of a tease going on here in the opening segment where she's put a nice little arrangement of what we're going to discuss in slides later on. Um, but to get started, sorry to do the old basic intro um, like we do with everyone, but I think it's important for everyone to know all this information so that they can get to know the artist the best. Forgive the thunderstorm in the background where I am. You're uh, but uh, Denise, tell us a little bit about how you got started in art and what in particular, you know, drew you in to work with pastel? Well, I started very young, had support from my folks when I was, uh, gosh, four or five years old and uh, kind of just kept growing. They were always supportive and, you know, it supplied me with the materials and you just take off from there if a kid has materials. <laughs> and, uh, you know, as I uh, grew up drawing and, and I didn't really get into painting until later and uh, the, the pastels actually came along at a great time because I was ready to do more color. And uh, I had someone suggest to me, why don't you try pastels? You know, it's, it's a drawing medium. <laughs> and uh, I thought, well, okay. And I, I mean, I was already married and had young kids, but my uh, husband and folks got together, gave me this uh, huge pastel set, huge to me. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about that later uh, about pastels, but it was, uh, it's like eye candy. You know, you look down and see all those colors. You can kind of see behind me there, uh, my, some of my pastels. Um, and it really was a nice transition for me from just charcoal, ink, drawing, into color with pastel. And uh, as I went along in pastels, I learned how to actually paint with pastels. So I consider what you see behind me as paintings. And they're, they're all pastels. I have a few oil studies um, on the easel, but what you see there is all uh, pastel on board. So anyway, I've been doing pastel since about, um, Seriously, I guess, <laughs> since about 1990. So it's hmm. been a while. <laughs> would, would you take a moment to share the precautions? Because um, I know that uh, when I first was introduced uh, to the world of pastels, uh, Lorenzo Chavez was the one who taught me a lot about uh, pastel yeah. painting. And uh, I had no idea the precautions you have to take uh, because of the way the pastels release when you, and I'll, I'll quit talking too much, but I'll let you educate <laughs> everyone, but just the release well, of when you work with it. Actually, uh, you know, uh, there was a big thing about that uh, early on when I started, and uh, it was like to wear gloves and a mask or not to wear gloves and a mask, and uh, you know, I just couldn't do it. Um, I think the big thing for me is you don't, uh, like if you're painting in studio, you don't take a brush after your work. Say if you wanna make a correction or change a part of your pastel painting, you can actually, it's very forgiving medium. You can actually brush off a little bit, but you take it outside, you know, you, you put on a mask if you're gonna do that sort of thing. But normally in my regular work, I don't uh, do that. Um, most pastels are non-toxic, you know, but there's some that, are, We'll give you the little warning label. <laughs> Certain reds and blues, you know, have the cads and the and the cobalt and stuff. So you have to be really careful. But um, actually, at the biggest thing I tell students, uh, don't ever blow on your pastel. 
<laughs> you need to clear off past delta so you never blow on it. So, you know, you just take precautions like that and you're fine. So instead of blowing on it, do you recommend a soft brush or what? Uh, if you're, uh, you work vertically with pastels, that's the best way to work. Because if you lay it flat, you're going to have all that dust built up because you're working on a, a sanded surface. You have to have the texture for the pastel particles to adhere. And uh, if you're working vertically on a board or, uh, you know, on an easel, you just you do what you can to keep it, the dust falling down. And I usually collect the dust like in a tray or a foil tray, you know, where uh, I can save the dust. And later on, I can make my own pastels from it. Um, so you can imagine the collection of pastel dust I must have, right? <laughs> make a nice abstract. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> just take it. And... All, all you need is a little water, a distilled yeah, just, water, you know, and that. Mush it on in. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, I just I, um, make sure I'm doing a vertical piece and you just uh, tap the back of the painting or you take it outside and that's when you can get the extra dust off. But normally if it's vertical, it's not gonna really build up, so. Well, I think that's a, a great lesson to be learned because you know people who are watching this, we have people who are interested in collecting and then we have people that really admire you as an artist and they think, well, if I watch this, maybe I can pick up a few tricks about pastels. So uh, obviously safety first, even if you're trying to create <laughs> something beautiful in art, you know, make sure you take care of you first so that you can keep creating beautiful pieces of art. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got a little slideshow here that I've gotten ready for us that I'll get started. So if everyone will, uh, get, once again, please be a little patient with me as I start my screen share. I am somewhat of a rookie on this. So let me see. Oh, oh wrong button. Oh, there we go. And I'm trying. Bye. All right, here we go. And I'll. Not to be too distracting, but I'll move us out of the way so that we're not <clears throat> we're not trying to make the piece ourselves. But this is a fun piece and one that I in particular find very fascinating. Um, anytime an artist paints in water, whether it's pastel, watercolor, oil, um, <clears throat> I just think water is very fascinating. And I will apologize. I Denise did send me her prices and updated, so I'll make sure I have these corrected on the website. Uh, but while we're talking today, Denise, while we're going through, if you don't mind, we'll just discuss the pricing for everyone who's interested and uh, we'll get it fixed from there. But here are some greater Canadian geese that are swimming in the river. Um, let's let's talk about what all you did to work with the water in this piece and the lights and darks and warms and cools on the sure. rock. <laughs> sure. This was um, inspired by a trip. Uh, to Georgia actually. And, you know, I, I painted along this river a few times, did some plein air and sketching and photography, of course. And I was fascinated just watching the geese as this, uh, this was a, uh, oh, there's a, a, like a dam controlled river. So, you know, the, the river was, the water was flowing pretty good, but at this point it was pretty shallow. So, you know, there, trolling along the river and fishing. <laughs> and uh, what I really enjoyed was the way the, the light and the flow of the water was, uh, it just made a beautiful design. And, and I, I love designing. So after many sketches, you know, I go forward with the painting, decide on my best um, composition. And uh, I decided I, I didn't want uh, background. I wanted the perspective where you're kind of looking across and down where uh, you didn't have the other bank showing or anything, you know, just the sky reflecting in the water. And uh, this one um, actually went through some changes. I did uh, add an extra goose coming in from the left at the bottom. <laughs> I had rocks there and it's just like, well, 
I think it worked better with the goose, but um, yeah, it was it was a fun piece, and I, I hope to do more. I was really fascinated with the rocks um, in that area and the slant they took and the color. That's another part of this inspiration on this painting was the colors I was seeing in the water, and uh, yeah, a more intimate view. So, was this piece done more in the midday uh, with the light? that you, you, you captured here? Uh, you know, it, it probably was late morning, you know, at, on towards the, the middle of the day. And uh, I don't mind working in a, a kind of overcast sky. Remember that it was, wasn't a real sunny day, you know, but uh, just enough, you know, to get that cloud cover reflecting. A lot of times with an overcast sky, you have a, uh, cooler tones and more, um, it's actually pretty bright, you know, so. <clears throat> Cause I know that, you know, in the mornings you chase shadows and in the <laughs> afternoons you work with shadows. Um, and in the middle of the day, there's not gonna be as much shadow work into a piece, but like you said, during a moderately to mostly overcast day, those cooler, cooler lights will make sure that there's no shadow involved, but uh, still make right. sure you're wearing your sunscreen because as my mother used to say, you can still get sunburned <laughs> on a cloudy day, young man. So you make sure you wear that sunscreen. Um, Amazing. <laughs> uh, so river trolling is a six, but 16 by 12 piece and it's a pastel. And Denise, how much are your 16 by 12s uh, priced at? Um, that's uh, 2,900. Okay. And again, since I was an airhead and I goofed uh, when we, put this on the YouTube for the broadcast and where we have the description section. I'll go ahead and add them there as well as make the corrections on the website as well so that we, we can help the viewers as much as possible. So again, I apologize to everyone. All right. This is a fun uh, study in Cloudscapes uh, Sanctuary, uh, tall piece, 36 by 30, uh, with a yeah. nice color in the trees along the far bank. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit more about this piece. Um, you know, this is really the first fully finished large piece that I've done since I moved to East Texas. Um, I moved here in October 2019, and I've just fallen in love with the rolling hills and you've got pine trees. But as you can see, you also have some hardwoods here that uh, it's really a nice fall. I mean, you get more color here than where I lived before in Central Texas uh, around Waco. And uh, this it's a, a friend's place, um, this little lake on her property. And I have just fallen in love with it. I try to get over there as often as possible. <laughs> but um, it, it really is a sanctuary. I mean, there's just so many, you'll see all kinds of birds, but my, uh, oh, that day, there, there are just so many uh, wonderful cloud formations. And of course, I love reflections of clouds in the water. Yeah. But uh, this one, uh, you know, going, I think it's one of my larger pieces, 3630. And uh, it, I just am fascinated with clouds and love painting sky. So that was the, the focus of this one. Of course, it's a cloud, cloud shapes. Well, and I, I did include a bird, you know, you, you can see uh, uh, a couple of little white herons down there. <laughs> and. Uh, well, when I used to be able to eat meat, I was a big duck hunter and I'm very much a, a sucker for a scene like this, just because one of my favorite things is that the actual hunting is the colors in the water, you know, in the morning, just as the sun's starting to rise and the iridescent yeah. that are in the waters uh, in, in those Texas areas, a friend of mine named Tom drags me all over Texas to hang out with him to go duck hunting. And, <laughs> you know, you really did an amazing job capturing that, you know, reflective light like you did uh, with just those subtle currents going through the water and the depth of the field back behind that midpoint tree line in the piece. Will you go over a little bit some of the tips and tricks you would advise on, you know, working with a cloud like this with that foreground of the gray and maybe some of the, the, the techniques you use to get that suggestive color and shape into that tree line in the foreground? You know, um, this piece actually became fall when it was really summer. <laughs> I am, 
I really like the idea of playing the warm tones off all that cool area in the sky, um, you know, with the blue grays and pinks and yellows. I mean, there's colors that you see in clouds and sky. Um, a lot of a lot of people don't see. I, I've heard the story. I was like, I didn't see that pink in that sky until the artist came along and started painting it, and, and then I could see it. Um, so it was a um, choice there to keep those values close and subdued in the tree line and the and the bottom part of the painting to really play up the the sky, you know. And just as far as pastels go. I do a lot of layering and this is done on a handmade board, which I prefer. That's my favorite thing. If I get the recipe right, <laughs> there's a, um, I use gator board that I seal with um, gesso. And it, so it's a nice rigid surface, but uh, then I come along with the pumice gel that you can, you can buy already prepared, but I usually throw in a little bit extra pumice or marble dust that I have and to give it a little more grit. And so once I prepare that surface, you, you can actually, when you get close to this piece, see like what look like brush strokes. So the really cool thing about that kind of surface is you can build it up. You can, you know, a lot of times I just prepare it with no thought of the painting, but sometimes you can maybe uh, do your strokes on that pumice gel mixture uh, according to what the painting is going to be, you know, to play up a different direction, directional stroke. So it's kind of fun. I like doing that. Don't always do that, but it's fun to do. How long does that process typically take to prepare the board? Because uh, I know a lot of people say, oh, well, the artist painted that in 45 minutes. It's like, well, they had to prepare 30 or 40 years <laughs> to be able to do that in 45 minutes. But, you know, from what I'm hearing, you know, this isn't just you know, you go walking through Walmart for goodness sakes. And, you know, you grab some tomatoes, some avocados, roll of toilet paper and, oh, hey, let me get a perfectly prepared board so I can whip out a pastel in 45 minutes. So how, how long does it take to prepare a board like that for a piece? Um, you know, you have to give it time to dry between layers. Uh, I usually uh, will take a day and prepare more than one. I'll just do several boards and, uh, I mean, it, it does take a little while. Um, the more, I mean, a little layering, you know, the more layering you do, the longer it takes, of course, but it dries pretty quick because it's an acrylic base um, product. But after it dries a little, you can sand down areas a little bit if you want, add more. So I try not to do more than say, you know, three layers at the most of this mixture on the board. Um, and then the actual uh, painting, you know, um, uh, with this piece, I took my time. I mean, I, I do uh, my studio work. I have several going at one time because I do move kind of slow. <laughs> and, you know, it takes a while to build up your layers your, from your block in. Um, similar to oils in that, you know, it's uh, thin to thick in oils. You start with darks to light. So with pastel, I start with a harder pastel, which has more binder in it, less pigment. Uh, and usually a block in is done with those. So you don't fill up the tooth of your board or paper too quickly. Um, and then you graduate to softer pastels as you go along. So the final lights, like in oils, you, your thickest strokes may be those lights or you know, your, your center of interest, whatever, but you, you leave your darks a little thinner and transparent and build up the lights. So in pastel, you can get those really soft, buttery pastels and get your, your light. It's like, it's like on this piece, you can see the, the highlights of the uh, light on the clouds. And that's just a really, uh, you put it on kind of heavy if you want. You still got enough tooth on your board to, to do that. And uh, in the trees and all of that, the water, especially a lot of times water is left as just like water. <laughs> you get more transparent or translucent um, effect with your pastels. And so, you know, I keep them a little bit on the harder side. But if you, if you use a soft pastel right up front, 
you take the risk of filling up the tooth too quick. But sometimes that's all the only pastel you have is a soft one that you you need that particular value and color. So um, you just have to have a light hand. So a lot of times, you know, I'll be painting along and I just my pastel drops out of my hand because I'm, I'm trying to keep it a really light touch on the board. So you just have to you learn that as you go. You know what works for me may not work for the the next artist working in pastels, but well, I think those are some <clears throat> excellent tips and some great advice about how to layer and how to use the various pastels to create the layer because that's one of my favorite things about your work are those buttery soft areas, uh, especially just above the tree line to the oh about a third of the way up to the left. You really are able to build up that sense of depth and and light with that light soft color of those clouds that builds up and builds into the grand design of the central focal point of the large cloudscape so I, it, you did a wonderful job with this piece i really thank you. It. thank you all right and now some more that was a good one <laughs> uh, <laughs> this piece is more, more clouds <laughs> yeah. i sent you a lot <laughs> hey, I've got a cloudscape for you here in Norman, Oklahoma. <laughs> it's called <laughs> Pouring Down by Clay Spear. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> what's what's another insurance claim? We already got a two billion dollar storm a few months ago. So oh, I don't know. Oh, uh, I know if you're making kind of shaking your boots sometimes, not just I love storms, but when you think about what you guys went through, oh my goodness, I'd be a little fearful of that, but but uh, we've had these incredible summer skies and I guess we're getting moisture off the Gulf. Uh, the Gulf. There's a storm down there. So it's kind of like, well, I love it. It's so hot. It, it's, it's hard for me to stand out there and paint it, but I do have a little porch here that I've, I've done plenty of just look out West and paint the, the clouds, you know, do some studies. That's um, great. Great opportunity to do those studies. So here in exactly. above all, I love that, you know, this openness of this piece, just kind of being out away from it all, so to speak. So uh, tell us more about where you were and, and what all went into creating this piece. Um, this was actually uh, uh, staying out in Fredericksburg area and uh, the property uh, next to my, my friends where I stay is just, just wide open ranch. Now the mesquites are starting to grow up back there, but I, I just uh, love the gracefulness of those trees, you know, but I, that's what you see in the foreground. Um, <clears throat> and that open, that hillside, um, I, it's just watching this whole theater, <laughs> this, this play, you know, it's, it was like a grand, wonderful thing watching these clouds build up from the horizon line on, on the right side and just, uh, that was just gorgeous. I, I was painting like crazy. I did about three different uh, oil studies for this piece. Uh, actually, this piece came from one of those studies. And, uh, you know, it's just a, one of those incredible things you get to, to uh, uh, experience outside and trying to, to work quickly to capture something, you know, on your, on your um, canvas or paper. And a lot of times with the oil paints, um, I don't know, sometimes it goes faster, sometimes it's slower for me and I'd be better off to have an easel with pastels over here and uh, oil paints over here and, and, and decide on the spot what I'm gonna do, but it doesn't usually work that way. It's either one or the other I have with me. Maybe you need um, to invent some kind of easel. It's got like a dual pop-up and- I know, right? <laughs> need to invent that. <laughs> <laughs> very useful. Well, um, you know, something that's very subtle in this piece, but makes it really work is <clears throat> how the topography of the, the ranch somewhat slopes from right to left, but then the tree line, you bring it back to level it off and then you lead the eye up into the cloudscape. Um, do you want to let us know a little bit about how you worked, worked with that and chose this location with the mesquites and and everything to have it all come together. 
Um, this actually, you know, was a studio piece from the, the Plain Air Studies. And though it's small, uh, it's kind of a intermediate piece for a larger scale piece, which once you do it several times and you change things up each time, now with this one, I know I want to, you know, maybe change the composition just a little bit. But uh, the mesquites, uh, when I painted this, I was looking more at that hillside uh, that was pretty wide open and the trees were more to my left. So I scooted those over a little bit and, um, you know, the darker hillside behind, actually I've done several of the other side of that hill uh, the same day, just the clouds were doing a whole different thing on that side. So I love to get some angles and diagonals in my pieces. So I use the uh, mesquite trees there to kind of take you back to the hill. And then uh, there were rays coming down through the clouds. So I indicated some of that happening at about that spot, you know, to lead you up and around. So, you know, I think a good painting is, is a lot about how you lead the eye through it and whether or not you have a, a, a central, you know, main focus, a center of interest or whatever you want to call it. Um, it's really taking the, the viewer on a little trip through your painting. And I think it's, uh, it, it's, it's fascinating and it's just fun to, to try to tell a story like that and to uh, do it in a subtle manner that, that is beautiful, you know, without having uh, arrows through your painting, you know, that, that take you uh, where it's too obvious and, you know, that could be a turn off. <laughs> but if you're doing it, I just um, keep in mind, you know, always go back to your, your roadmap, your studies, you know, your question is, why did I want to paint this? And keep that foremost, you know, I think you'll, you'll get it figured out. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I really like how you, you have those little subtle casts of uh, light coming down because I know when I'm looking at a scene like this, that's one of the things that just out in nature is one of my favorite things to, to really look at and stare at. And uh, kind of from the last piece where we talked about building up, you can tell you spent a lot of time building this piece up to get all the effects in there that you wanted to get in. So I think you did a fantastic job on this one. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, you, we've talked a little bit about oil uh, here and yeah. there throughout the show. And so now we have an oil on canvas. And, uh, right. <laughs> you know, I know that a lot of times artists talk about they want you to be able to smell the air and they want you to feel, you know, the cold. And uh, right. this just is such a great piece in that you, know, you first look at it and you go, oh, there's a lot of white in there. And then you really start looking at it and you can tell that you are looking through that snow, that cold, that thick, cool air. And you, know, you can start to see some of the structures in the background and some of the other little things that are in there. So uh, let's, let's talk through this piece about what all you did to create that, that very cool, cold effect. Wow, well, uh, this is pretty new to me. And when we had all that snow this year, a very rare for, for Texas. And gosh, I mean, it was everywhere, wasn't it? <laughs> And it was just so beautiful. And, and this is the view pretty much from my studio window uh, across the property. Um, and it, it just it's, it has a draw for, for me. And the snow just, I, I just had to paint it. <laughs> and uh, so this was, uh, you know, a studio piece. I did look out, uh, did a lot of uh, sketching. Um, I didn't do so much painting while the snow was here, uh, but I think this was the January snow we had. So it, it was just you know, heavy collecting on the trees. It was just absolutely beautiful. But I, I knew I wanted to keep that close value range uh, with the little temperature shifts in the, the sky and in the background trees. And I just had a lot of fun with this. This is my first time to really try painting snow. And I was gonna say, I do get help sometimes 
from the masters who have come before, I have a pretty good library. So I pulled out Twatman, <laughs> Metcalf, uh, just a variety of artists that uh, I admire. And I, I really enjoy uh, John Twatman's work and his, especially his snow scenes, because you feel like you're in a snowstorm looking at some of his paintings. I mean, there's just a minimalist thing going on with just very few values. And so I, with this piece, uh, my goal was really just to, to try it out and see if I could make it work. <laughs> so I hope to do more. I mean, I, I just, I don't live where it snows. So I feel like I, I can't do it justice unless I'm standing in it or something. <laughs> but, you know, looking out my window, doing some studies, um, maybe I'll, in the future I'll be able to go someplace that will, you know, spend some winter time just trying to paint snow. It's fun. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> well, I know a place you can go and get some snow. I, I know a guy who has a, a place out in Cloudcroft, New Mexico, that can oh, yeah. <laughs> come have you come out during the winter and paint some snow. And uh, if we can't get you some yeah. snow, have you head out to the White Sands and uh, paint those because those oh. are uh, pretty fascinating. <laughs> pretty fascinating. Ah, so. Sounds great. <laughs> well, the, the minimalistic on the color values, I think, really makes this piece pop because it is, you know, very subtle and suggestive, but there's, there's a lot going on here. Um, did, you, did you spend a pretty good amount of time blocking it in before you came back in and, and used those subtle values to create the cold effect? Um, well... Yeah, I guess I, I guess I did. I mean, there was as you go along. A lot of times it's subtractive. The other times you're adding. And I think on this piece, um, there is a lot of scraping going on. <laughs> and I don't mean just to take away, but just to get the effect of the snow. I did use palette knife a bit. Um, you know, I just kept my values. As you can see, I, I didn't go really dark on the dark values because they're, I wanted to give the sense of the snow actually still falling. And um, this is one of those, I guess you have to, to visit it up close <laughs> to see. But um, yeah, I, I guess that's it. I don't know what else to tell you, but it, it was a it, it, almost an experiment for me because I had not really painted this subject before and uh, or this condition or light effect. I mean, it it's just was really different and uh, enjoyable. <laughs> like I said, I got to do more. <laughs> well, I hope that you do because you can definitely tell that you saw this scene as a as an artist and as an oil painter and pastel extraordinaire as well. But that you know, when you're in a scene like this and it is that cold and it's, you know, the snow's still coming down. I mean, this is really a muted view of what you see when you're in a storm like this. And I think you did a very, very good job of it. And so it's, it's exceptional. Thank you. Thank you. A sure hope. Now to me, this is my favorite. I know I'm not supposed to say I have a favorite of the group, but I just love all the elements here, the cloudscape, the water, um, what's coming down and falling from the sky and the lights and darks. Um, big fan of this piece. So let's, let's, let's jump in and talk about it. Oh, thank you. I, I had so much fun with this piece. I, um, it's been kind of percolating, you know, for a while in, in my head. Um, I had this, uh, some wonderful photos I had taken uh, on a flight. Um, I don't fly that often but I did manage to, to keep my camera in my lap and get pictures. <laughs> and I have uh, the pictures from up above these clouds uh, where it looks like I mean, it's just heavenly, <laughs> beautiful, beautiful uh, clouds up, up above and peaceful. And we had to go through that. This was the final approach to Austin um, from the plane. And you know, it's just interesting uh, a little bit, the story, you know, just going through the turbulence that you have to go through, to go through storm clouds, and then getting on the other side and seeing that rain just right there coming down. 
And, but what really grabbed me was seeing the, the water, the river snake back there. And, and uh, just that little bit of orangey light coming through. Yeah, that it just spoke to me. <laughs> and um, it, it was a different perspective. I enjoyed that. Uh, edited out a lot of uh, buildings that are along the uh, river there near Austin. And I just thought, you know, it needs to, I don't really want to show uh, man's presence in this one. Even though he's there, you know he's there. <laughs> but, you know, it's all about that. Seeing the light through the storm. I love <clears throat> that about paintings in particular, um, you know, is that the artist has the freedom and the ability to not just put down exactly what they saw, but to actually add their perspective as an artist of making something that's more of just a scene of nature like this, instead of having some yeah. buildings in there to where you don't really want to look at that. You want to just focus on the beauty of the scenery. And I, I think it really works here in this piece. Thank you. <laughs> Will you let us know kind of what one of your techniques are about with the rain that's cascading down, what you do to uh, bring that suggestive visual effect into the piece? You know, that's another uh, light-handed kind of thing. You could get really um, heavy, and this just being rain coming down now, if it was uh, a, a real heavy storm, then of course you you just apply more pressure with the pastel. But with this, uh, sometimes I'll use like a, a little bit harder pastel and just drag downward um, and if it doesn't quite have the shape I want or doesn't end where I want it you know you, it's easy enough to take a very soft small brush and go back in and kind of knock off pastel uh, the best thing to do is kind of know exactly where you want those strokes and put in them intentionally deliberately so you're not going back and Oh, that's not working. Scratch by scratch, and you know, paint it out, or you know, lift it. Have to lift it out. And you're not doing it over and over and over, because uh, that was certainly will change the whole um, layers of pastel right there, and it won't have a fresh, spontaneous look. So um, it doesn't work all the time, and you do have to, to kind of correct it and go back. But um, yeah, I just I think that was a like a soft, or not a soft, a hard to medium soft pastel stroke. And I use a pastel, a lot of my pastel sticks are broken in half, or I'll be using a quarter inch or a half inch to an inch long pastel um, to stroke. To, it's kind of mimics a, like paint stroke, you know, it's the width of a paintbrush. So that's why part of the reason I don't call these pastel drawings they're really paintings. Um, Anyway, I, it was just a matter of the right size pastel. And it's more than one um, value or, and color combination there. Well, I think it really, that really. That. <laughs> Go ahead. So I hope that answered that question. It did very much so, because you can tell that you use those techniques to really capture the fact that that wind's blowing that that rain that's falling at an angle. And uh, I, I, that's, I love the composition of the piece and the water and the color on the water and the, and the light from the sky. But I, I think the extra time you took with that light handed approach with those pastels really sets this piece off. Well, thank you. All righty, September Fields. And in the email, uh, we're, we were going back and forth. You said you came back and snuck some birds in, so let's, I did. <laughs> let's talk about this that. Is, I want to enjoy. Okay, yeah. Um, this is also on a handmade board. Uh, this is uh, from a trip to Wyoming uh, in 2018. I did an artist residency up there with a friend. We went up together uh, to the Brenton Museum in Bighorn, and I absolutely fell in love with that part of Wyoming, the Bighorn Mountains, and this is part of the foothills that you see bef before the mountains. <laughs> it's just fascinating. I just love the colors and the time of year I was there. It was like September, early September. And uh, this was done in the studio 
from photographs and also just notes. I mean, I, I do a lot of, when I'm outdoors in, in a place, sometimes it comes down to just observing and taking your sketchbook, doing some sketches and then just writing a lot of notes and uh, maybe even just color note, color swatches, not a full blown study of this particular scene. And uh, that all plays in when you're working in your studio. Uh, just put them all out, look at all the studies and have several photographs I'm looking at. And then uh, just come up with the, the studio piece. So uh, this one, you know, I, I finished it for the show that was in 2019. The, uh, we went back for the first artist in residency show and uh, at, at the Brenton and you know this was one of my my major pieces for that but I knew you know looking at it there it's like ah oh, you know I, I, I wish I would have done this you know we artists are, are just notorious for that <laughs> but you keep it to yourself but it's like I, I knew that I, I did accomplish what I was out for in the hills because the colors there were just beautiful, like a tapestry. And I think I did okay with that. But when I got it home, um, I decided that it needed some life. And I didn't want to put cows in, though there were cows back in the distance. So I, I opted for the birds that you, you do have to get close to see them. <laughs> but they're in the treetops and coming, flying out from the trees. And uh, a lot of times, Clay, when, uh, when you get a piece home, um, I've got another piece, I've had that story. In my first gallery show I ever did, uh, it was also when my largest pastel at the time. So it was a, a 30, 24, and it was an intimate view of water. And uh, you may have even seen it, but it, it started out being called Crystal Clear. And it was the Llano River looking into the water. And I just had so much fun with the design of it. And it was in the first show and thank goodness, I'm, I'm grateful it did not sell because I, I took it home and it lived in my studio for a while and I would just be working on other things and look at it. And, uh, you know, after a while I knew exactly what it needed and I made the changes to it and it became Living Waters and it was a, a much better painting having changed it. Um, you know, so if, if paintings end up back in my studio a lot of times <laughs> they'll come out again as a different painting you know slightly revised or you know hey it, it, it's it's fun to do and it i think it makes the painting overall a better piece so now, the life of this one helped it i know artists have said a painting's usually really never finished it's just abandoned do you think that <laughs> when artists see their work at a show and they decide, well, I hope that doesn't sell because I'd like to take it back and rework it. Do you think it's because you're getting a different perspective of the piece, you know, at a gallery opening or whatever, that it's not in your studio or you're not right up on it trying to complete the piece? Do you think maybe that different perspective is there or is it just an artist thing that you're never satisfied with it? <laughs> well, I think it has to do with time too, you know, um, also, you're seeing it framed, and I like to pop them in the frame in my studio, and artists have to learn to have a really discerning eye, and I don't think mine is really discerning sometimes. <laughs> so when it ends up in a, uh, we're always hopeful for sales, of course, you know, so if it had sold, though, I, it would not have become the, the piece that it became, you know, it's just not like, oh, this is my my uh, <laughs> the best piece ever but it was it was just enough to um kind of open my eyes to it and you know i think i think it more it has to do with you the time and the time you have that you're growing as an artist and you'll see things later that you want to try and you have the opportunity because it's back in your studio <laughs> why not right <laughs> but anyway yeah i think um, I usually finish a piece, um, 
when I'm finished solving problems. <laughs> when the last problem is solved and you think you got it, it's good to have time to let that piece sit in your studio for a while and either turn it away or upside down and just give it some time to, uh, to look at it one more time before it's time to send it off. And, and uh, if, you're, if you are fortunate to have the time, that's when you make those changes. But for me, a lot of a lot of times it's like, oh, time's up, got to send it out. <laughs> so, you know, um, you learn that way, it, it it all comes out in the wash. <laughs> well, you do a fabulous job. One thing I'd like to touch on before we move on from September Fields, you mentioned that when you were there, you did some color value studies and things like that. Do you just focus on general tones and light or you know if we look at these mountains that are in the background of this piece uh, you know there's certain shadows in the crevasses and and things like that and the different right. direction that that these big huge boulders in the mountains are facing what parts are you focusing on when you're trying to get those those studies and those color values down um you know I as the light plays across the, the landscape, a lot of times it's just a quick note to, to capture that. Say if you've got a lot of clouds and sun and light and cloud shadows. Now this was a, a again, you could, you could see it was a little bit of an overcast type day. Um, and I'm drawn to that. I'm drawn to that just real uh, subtle kind of lighting. But it, so this piece doesn't have a super strong light hitting anywhere really. Um, so the sense that the colors I'm going for, uh, or the notes, color notes, um, maybe it had to do more like on this one with getting the, the right, uh, in person, what I was seeing on the hillside and in that foreground field. Um, so I could go back cause your photographs are not going to tell the truth. You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. don't care how good your camera is. You're not going to have, it's not the same as your eyes seeing. So of course. Uh, if you can get down those notes there, you've got that to go back to when you're finally painting it in the studio instead of relying on the photo, which is really should be more of a jumping off point. A photo can kind of inspire you by the, the shapes you see or help you with the design or detail. I mean, if you want to zoom in a photo and really see what's going on right there, kind of like having binoculars outside. I need a good pair of binoculars, but <laughs> you know, if you're out painting and you're looking through your binoculars, you, you're, you know, you could zoom in to see those colors and values and the textures and all of that. But um, uh, the other thing is squinting. <laughs> that does a good trick. <laughs> well, that's the end of the slideshow. Right. So here we are and we're back. <laughs> to our traditional screen. Um, well, I, I, I thank you for sharing all your insight and tips and tricks and some of the things that you do when you're, when you're creating your pieces. And it's also been a treat chatting with you and seeing the pieces not up close. Uh, to remind the viewers, we really try to get in on those slides really nice and tight uh, for everyone yeah. who's not able to see the pieces in person. As you can see behind her right now, you can see the pieces as they are as you'd probably just walk into a gallery setting and see them and then want to walk up and get closer to the piece to really get a good look at the brush strokes. So yeah. we had a nice little mix of the best of both worlds here today. Um, but before we sign off, sign off, uh, what, what all do you have going on uh, here in the, the near future with workshops or art shows or uh, different events coming up? Uh, let's see. Well, um, I have a, a big project I'm working on, thus the, the sky pieces, uh, next year. Uh, that'll be at the Museum of uh, Western Art, I'm sorry, Museum of Western Art in Kerrville, uh, called The Heavens Declare, Celebrating the Glory of the Skies. And this is a, a group show that I put together and, and uh, it's gonna be April 1st through J July 9th with the opening, the, 8th and 9th, I believe, of April, so the first full weekend of April. Um, anyway, that 
is a, a big deal for me because this project has been uh, in the works for a long time. I, I've done pieces off and on with it in mind. So really kind of a, a heart's desire thing. I, I've thought about it and thought about it. And finally, uh, someone was very willing to say yes and <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> so thanks to Daryl Beecham at the museum. Uh, that, that's the big thing coming up. And I will be teaching a workshop out there uh, in May and pastel. And of course, it'll have to do with skies. <laughs> and it'll be a cloud sky, different types of sky painting uh, workshop. And in between now and then, you know, just a, a lot of uh, outdoor work and studio work. So getting in, getting prepared for it. <laughs> Well, we're excited to see what all you create in the, in the interim between those. Yeah. Events. So, well, for all of you who are interested in collecting one or more of these pieces, uh, we'll make sure we have all our information down below as well as the corrected and fixed pricing uh, in the YouTube post when we get this online uh, and this, this program debuts. Uh, but again, for those of you who like to just listen and play on your phone while you're watching the program, <laughs> Uh, the website is grapevinegalleryokc.com, or you can email me from the website, uh, call or text, happy to help you however you're most comfortable. Uh, but again, Denise has created some beautiful pieces here. Uh, hopefully, they find a home with you and your collection. Uh, we'd be happy to help you out with that in any way we can. Uh, but once again, Denise, thank you so much for taking your time to talk art with us today and talk about yourself and your work. It's been uh, just been a lot of fun. Thanks, Clay. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks for letting me just talk and ramble and <laughs> answer questions. It's great. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's not rambling. It's just a time to talk a little bit about the art you create and, and share with everyone your thoughts on your own work. And I think people oh, can really enjoy you. that. So I appreciate it. <laughs> hopefully, uh, hopefully we have another show with Denise coming up soon and maybe even hosting a workshop in New Mexico. So I'd like to work with everyone on that. And Denise and I'll talk further. And when there's time to make an announcement, we'll make sure we make one. So but until you. then, Denise, thank you once again. And thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>